What's up, guys? Welcome back to another Daily Bible Reading Snapshot. Today we're looking at Isaiah 29 and 30 here in the Old Testament. And then we're looking at Ephesians chapter 6 in the New Testament. So here in chapter 29, one of the things you're going to see is the name Ariel is going to be brought up. We think that's a reference to Jerusalem. So we're clearly talking about the city of Jerusalem here. It says, in an instant, suddenly, you will be visited by the Lord of hosts with all this great wonder and all this stuff. You are going to be visited. Now, the attackers, the people who are going to try to attack Israel, well, specifically, um, the people who are going to try to attack the city of Jerusalem, it says, are going to be unsatisfied. It's going to be like they're drinking a bunch of water in their dream, but they're waking up and they're still really thirsty. That's what it says it's going to be like for these people who come and are, they're about to attack and then they leave unsatisfied. We're going to see that worked out in history later on in this book. We're going to see specifically the Assyrians, they come to take out Jerusalem, then they're going to be turned back and they're going to be unsatisfied. Um, then it says here in verse 13, the problem with the people is they right now are drawing near to God with their lips and they're honoring God with their lips, but their hearts, they're far away from God. They're not ready to repent. They're not ready to turn from their sin. They're just living in it continually and they're not giving it up. Then it says he's going to do wonderful things. Sometimes we see wonderful things. That's not always talking about good. That's talking about powerful. So sometimes the wonderful things that God does, specifically the wonderful works of God, you might be thinking of the 10 plagues. Now, are those wonderful? Well, they're wonderful in the sense that they show wonder. They show God's amazing power. But it doesn't always mean it's good for the people he acts to. No, it doesn't always mean that. Sometimes his, his judgment is wonderful. Now, verse 15 says, Ah, you who hide deep, you who hide deep from the Lord, your counsel. You think you're hiding from God with all your, your smart talk that you have. Whose deeds are in the dark. Who say, who sees us or who knows. You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say to its maker, he didn't make me, or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. What this is saying is that's what people do with God. When they start to act like their sin's not going to get found out, it's like saying to the potter as the clay, like, oh, well, you, you didn't make me. You're not responsible for me. I don't have to, I don't have to live in any way you want me to. That's foolishness. Of course you do, because you've been, you've been designed by God. You've been designed to live for him and you've chosen to not live for him. You've been designed for righteousness and you've been doing evil. So it says, look, just know that those who wait on God, the meek, those people, they're going to obtain joy from the Lord. But the people who go against God, they are not going to do that. And that's the same thing today. If you choose to reject the gospel, if you choose to respond to the gospel call by saying, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, well then look, the promises of Isaiah 29, you need to hear those and say, wow, that those are coming for me right now. He calls us all to turn from our sins and repent, but he says, don't be one of those stubborn people. That's actually how verse chapter 30 starts. It says, ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who make, who carry out a plan, but not mine, right? That's the problem. They're making plans and trying to do their own thing, uh, but not God's plans. Their plans are, let's go find refuge in Egypt, which is so interesting because it's such a reversal. It's like you see these people of Israel who were brought up out of Egypt, out of the slavery in Egypt. You see them turning back to the slavery in Egypt saying, we'll be your slaves. Just protect us from the Assyrians. God says, stop that. That is not how this should be. You're a rebellious people. It says in verse 9, they're a rebellious uh, people and lying children. Children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord. And they go to their prophets and their seers and they say, hey, um, can you tell us smooth words? Don't tell us what God says. I don't want to hear God's word. I, wanna, I don't want to listen to God, but I just want to hear a, a nice message today. Hey, prophets, can you give us some, some nice smooth talk? I don't want to hear that judgment talk anymore. I want to hear this smooth talk. That's what they're doing. Which again, can you see the parallels today? So many people don't want to hear about the wrath of God because they know they are living under the wrath of God. They know if God judges their sin, they will be in trouble. That's why we need to hear the, the message of the wrath of God and turn to the mercy of God that we find in Christ, the forgiveness that's available through the shed blood of Jesus. So he goes on and he says, look, if Israel doesn't want to repent, if they're continually turning away, then God, God is going to show his, his, his mercy in the end, but his, his wrath now. That's what verse 18 says. I think it's such an interesting summary of what we've been reading. This is Isaiah 30, verse 18. It says, therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Therefore, he exalts himself to show you mercy. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. What that means is he's going to wait to show his mercy because he'll show mercy to these people, but not until he shows his justice for the people who reject him. 
He will show it. Don't worry. He will be merciful. He's going to show his grace, but he doesn't do that until afterwards. He doesn't do that until after he shows justice because he is a God of justice. Then he says, look, there's going to come a day where people in Zion, they're going to give up their idolatry. They're not going to be serving the gods of wood and stone anymore. They're going to serve the Lord. He says, God's going to show them mercy. And this is a great section uh, here in Isaiah 30 about how good God's going to be to the world when they turn from their sin. And there will come a day when these Jewish people in particular, at the end, it says in Romans 11, they will turn from their sin. And God's going to be good to the world because there will come a day, remember, when Jesus will reign in righteousness. And who's going to be left? Only the people that bow the knee to Jesus. Only the people that in this life submitted to the gospel call and said, yes, I will follow Jesus no matter what. Yes, I will turn from my sin. Yes, I will believe in Jesus and trust in his righteousness alone. That I'm not good enough. That I need to be covered in the righteousness of Christ. Those people, that describes you. You're going to live in his new world. And that's what we're going to continue to see developed in the book of Isaiah. So that's our Old Testament reading. Today, we're reading the New Testament, some specific commands for Christians. In Ephesians chapter 6, the first command comes to children, people who have parents. It says, hey, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The first command with a promise. All right, so that means if you are a person living in someone else's home as a child, they're your parents, you're the child, you have a responsibility. Obey them in the Lord. What about parents? Well, fathers, it says, don't provoke your children to anger. Don't make them angry on purpose. Instead, what you should do is instruct them, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The correction and the direction of living for God. What does it look like to live for God? What does it look like to live for the Lord? That's what parents should do. So if you're a parent, that's your responsibility. Instruct your child. Train them up. Discipline them when they do wrong. Train them in the right way. Then it says, hey, slaves, people love these bosses. And remember, slavery, not the same as what you might picture. Um, clearly, there was a contract where they were um, going to be enslaved for a while, but um, it wasn't kidnapped slavery we're talking about here. It seems like we're talking about um, a, a consensual agreement between two parties coming together and saying, I'm going to be your slave for seven years. I'm going to be your slave for 12 years. I'm going to be a con on contract for you for five years. So tons of different types of slaves here. But it says, hey, slaves, obey your earthly masters. And remember, do that with fear and trembling. Fear God more than you fear your master. Don't be a people pleaser. Don't just serve your master and just do whatever so that he sees that it's okay and then you really aren't serving him. Serve him with sincerity. Do it wholeheartedly for God because God's going to take note of that. Then it says on the other end of the spectrum, you've got masters who, who are, are responsible for their slaves. He says, hey, you know what? Do the same. Uh, make sure that you are being generous and kind with your people and stop threatening. Because a lot of these masters would threaten stuff that they didn't mean. And says, look, stop threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. Re realistically, if you're a person who owns um, th these workers, just know, hey, if you're a master, you've got a master too. And he's not just your master, he's their master. So know that he's taking account of what you're doing too. You're just a steward for God. Now, then it says, be careful as you enter this spiritual warfare that the world has for us. Be careful that you're not unequipped. Be careful that you go into this battle without the right equipment. The armor of God is what's described here. The things that God gives you and me to fight in the Christian life, to fight against the world, and to fight against all the bad teachings that we hear in the world. Well, this is all described here. So you're going to read the symbolic pictures of what it looks like um, to be fighting in this spiritual battle. And he says at the end, hey, make sure that you're praying for me. Paul asks for prayer for them. He says, please pray that I would boldly proclaim the gospel. That God would continue to open doors for me to continue to speak about Christ. The very end of this book, he says, hey, I'm sending Tychicus to you. Um, he's a great guy. Um, you're going to enjoy his company. He says, and by the way, um, for everyone who loves Christ, hey, peace be with you. Grace to you, specifically grace to you, um, if you love the Lord, Jesus Christ, with love that is incorruptible. Um, make sure that your love for Jesus doesn't fade away. Make sure you don't have love that's there for a little bit and gone for a while. Um, it's interesting that we see this is the last phrase that we see addressed to the Ephesians until the book of Revelation. Which is probably about 30, 40 years later, we see the book of Revelation is written um, and Jesus speaks to the church in Ephesus. And you know what he says to them? You've lost your first love. So their love was corruptible. They didn't love Jesus with the love incorruptible. That's a warning for us as we see this last verse. Um, we want to love Jesus with a love that's incorruptible. The Ephesians, they, they didn't do a great job of that. They lost their first love. Let's make sure as we're fighting this Christian battle that we don't lose our first love, that we don't get distracted by worldly things, but we set our focus on the goals that Jesus gives us and we trust that he's going to enable us to do that. So thanks for reading. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot. Thank you.